Hello Book 2. I have a little mail to go through with you, an old ritual on this channel that I want to continue, even though I don't get ten books in the mail anymore. <laughs> so there, there are no books here, but there are some remarkable things, and it's worth talking, worth chatting with you, seeing your face. Of course, I got periodicals. I got two periodicals. One is the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, an old-style broadsheet newspaper put out on uh, the island of Martha's Vineyard off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, the headline is, Case is Still Low, uh, but the vineyard feels pandemic's grip. Uh, this is, there you've got some great pictures here of people out for a drive with masks on. Uh, and the article, the, that's the whole front page, and the article mentions that the, the vineyard still has very few cases, tiny number of cases, but that the health officials on the island are worried because, as one of them puts it, we're not as isolated as we think we are. There are still shipments every day from Boston. The ferry still comes every day from Boston. So, so the, we are still at risk. And uh, it's a greater risk because if the virus is, it, it gains, it gains a real toehold on a tiny island, that could be really bad. <laughs> really, really bad. Uh, and I, I love reading the Vineyard Gazette. I, like most people, I start in the back. The back page is the Vineyard Gardener, which is my favorite. And then Bird News and All Outdoors where you get, uh, the, the vineyard is home to die-hard birders. Die-hard birders. But also, uh, the vineyard gardener is a, a wonderful spicy column. Starts off with a whole bunch of observations about what's coming into bloom, or what you can do in your greenhouse, or whatnot. And, uh, winds up with equally spicy, uh, commentary on current events. <laughs> so, like most people who love the Vineyard Gazette newspaper, I often start at the back and work my way forward. Uh, but the the, uh, the rest of it is the editorials in the middle, all sorts of great ruminative editorials about coping with uh, with a new world, with a new world order, with how the Vineyard has is bracing for this for this change. And of course, the biggest change that the Vineyard is bracing for is not the handful of people on the island who have tested positive for COVID-19. The big change that is headed for the vineyard like a freight train is summer. When vineyard businesses make 90% of their, that's when they do 90% of their business. That's when the vineyard's population multiplies by a factor of 100 for four months. And nobody on the vineyard wants to think about what it will be like if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, who knows what the island will be like in October? Who knows what that will be like? Everything is geared on the island for the summer tourist traffic. If that traffic doesn't happen, that is, it is a very, very different scenario than, for instance, if you were, if you were let's say a Jaws example, if you were, if you were, the vineyard were home to, let's say, uh, a surfer in early April were killed by a shark off Gay Head or whatever. And that made first local headlines and then national headlines screaming for news. And suddenly it, everybody was talking about Jaws and everybody was saying, oh my God, is there a shark problem? Because seal populations everywhere along the Eastern Sea Coast are booming. And if you have a booming seal population, you are going to have more great white sharks. That's just a matter of course. That's just nature. It's not that the sharks hate humans. It's that they're going where the food is. And seals are protected, so their populations are booming. That's all a good thing. That, all of that is very good. And uh, if that were to happen in early April, then maybe some businesses at the vineyard would be worrying. Okay, when the tourists get here at the start of summer, are they going to be going to the beaches? They're obviously not going to be going in the water. But that has actually happened. Tour vineyarders have known for a couple of years that the sharks that there's a much greater shark population now than there ever has been, and they find that it it's not a big deal. You can enjoy yourself every bit as much in a place as lovely and wonderful and friendly as Martha's Vineyard, whether you're splashing out 300 yards from shore or not. You, it, it, it some businesses might worry, but there's still going to be uh, four and a half million people coming to the island. They're still going to want ice cream and fudge, and party treats, and rentals. This is completely different. This is a nuclear bomb. This is what happens if nobody comes? What happens if we don't have a summer when we're a summer resort island? And I don't, I, I will watch avidly to see what happens. I don't, I, as far as I know, in living memory, nothing like this has happened. So we'll have to see. Uh, but another periodical that I got 
uh, the other end of the spectrum, I love it just as much, but it's incredibly different reading experience, is the TLS, the Times Liter the London Times Literary Supplement, which is the greatest English language literary journal in the world. Uh, and I love it. And we've been going through it regularly here, so I thought we'd do it again. And, of course, uh, our first port of call will be the letters page. Because if, you, if you've been watching these TLS updates, you know that there's been a brouhaha boiling on the letters page of the TLS about George Steiner, of all people. About the late, great critic, George Steiner. Uh, and whether or not he was denied promotion because of anti-Semitism. And the... the uh, Either way, you lose opposition point that was brought up in a few letters was, no, no, he wasn't denied promotion because of anti-Semitism. He was denied promotion because he was such a jerk. <laughs> it's like, you can't win for losing if you're George Steiner in this whole thing. And it's gone on and on. And in this letters page, they print uh, one last letter from Patrick Carnegie at Ellsworth, Cambridgeshire, that I think is meant to stand. It's the only letter they print. I'm sure they got more. And I, I think it's meant to put the whole thing to bed. Uh, so I thought we'd go through that, just so you get closure on this whole storyline, although I don't think many of you care about George Steiner. Uh, I may be able to shed a little light on George Steiner's failure to get a permanent academic position at Cambridge. Everybody thinks they may be able to shed a little light. Uh, though I would rather think of this as the university's failure to take, quote, that extraordinary fellow, close quote, fully on board. Reading engineering in the early 1960s, I may have been one of those whom Steiner had been expressly invited by, by science-oriented Churchill College to help civilize. At any rate, I recall the enthralling series of lectures which, I imagine, were supposed to have been Steiner's audition for a lectureship in the English faculty. They had been billed as, quote, the new poetics. That was the title that they were billed, that this series of lectures was billed for. Arriving at the podium, he began something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I must apologize. I fear you may be here under a misapprehension. I have to confess that I do not know what the new poetics are, or could be. With your permission, I shall now lecture you on Freud, Marx, and literature. This, of course, was the title he had originally proposed to the English faculty, and had been, and it had been rejected. No conceivable connection with English tripos, that he was told. They doubtless imagined that the new title had to do with Yeats, Eliot, Pound, and would therefore be just about past muster. Unsurprisingly, and to its shame, the faculty never forgave him. The lectures were packed out. But to those who were fortunate enough to have been there, a new world of intellectual excitement opened up, which has remained with me to this day. And once again, we're not 100% we're not sure of what's being defended here or what's going on. Certainly, I, I can't be the only person who reads that anecdote and thinks, oh, if that is true, then the fact that he was well within its rights to deny this guy, since he lied to them. He allowed the, a lecture to be publicized when he knew he wasn't going to give that lecture. He was going to give something else. I, if I were an English, had been on the English faculty at that college when he had done a trick like that, I would have said, well, no matter how brilliant his, the lecture that he actually gave was, we don't want him. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm part of the problem. <laughs> but in this particular issue of the TLS, before we get to the letters page, we get to one of the highlights of the whole issue. The very first piece in this issue is one of the highlights of the whole thing. It's a long review by Lucy Scholes. Uh, who, let's see here, she, re, she writes Recovered, a monthly column for the Paris Review about out of print and forgotten books that shouldn't be, and she's the manning, managing editor of the literary magazine The Second Shelf, Rare Books and Words by Women. And uh, she writes a review here of Helen Taylor's book Why Women Read Fiction that is amazingly good. Just amazingly good as a review. Just amazingly good. It tells you what the book is. It gives the book every bit of a chance to be itself, it argues for the book and for the book's arguments, and it also takes issues with things that the author doesn't like or that the author disagrees with. Just amazing. I wanted it to go on for four or five more pages, but that would have lessened it. I'm glad the TLS started with that. That was terrific. And then we move on. This is actually a, a themed issue. Despite, despite that rather wonderful cover, this, the, the themed issue here is Shakespeare. And there are the, the first few articles are all about books on Shakespeare, new books on Shakespeare. And one of them, one of the first ones is by Emma Smith, who does a double review of Untimely Deaths in Renaissance Drama by Andrew Griffin and Death by Shakespeare by Catherine Harkip. And Death by Shakespeare sounds like a book I really want to read. Uh, it was published by uh, Bloomsbury, but I believe it was published by Bloomsbury UK. I don't think American Bloomsbury has any plans to publish it this year. Uh, but it, it's all about how people die in Shakespeare and why they do it. It's got some really good bits to it. Uh, 
let's see here. Harkup's entertaining death by Shakespeare uh, uses Shakespeare as the lens to understand the physiology of death in pre-modern times. She is relentlessly and sometimes illuminatingly literal. She asks, for example, what snake small enough to be hidden in a basket of figs could have killed Cleopatra and Charmian with a single bite? <laughs> Perhaps an Egyptian cobra, but its fangs would have been rather more painful, especially on the nipple, than is suggested by the claim that the puncture was, quote, as sweet as balm. <sighs> and not only that, but an Egyptian cobra almost never, I have been bitten by an Egyptian cobra, and the, 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 uh, the writer, Emma Smith, is completely correct. It is a horrible, horrible experience. And, only, and not only that, but Egyptian cobras, like so many cobras, like to make a big deal out of the fact that they're going to bite you. Most poisonous snakes do. American rattlers, for instance, will make a big deal. And the reason they do that is not because they're drama queens, it's because they don't want to bite you. Venom is extremely draining for a body to produce. It's a very high, pro high cost thing for a body to produce. No venomous animal wants to waste it. Which is why a great number of venomous snakes are brightly colored, or they have big fandangos that they go through before they bite you. Uh, so uh, the idea of, of, of an Egyptian cobra sort of lying in wait in a basket of figs and just sort of gently biting you when you reach your hand in, it's not, it wouldn't be a, a, an Egyptian cobra's preferred method of delivering its venom. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, she uses NASA statistics to work out precisely how young Arthur's body would have been broken by his fall from the battlements of different possible heights in King John. The lack of forensic evidence makes it impossible to judge whether he fell or was pushed. She reviews the low number of fatalities from normally shy brown bears in Europe. Antigonus's grave mistake was running. Rather than an exit pursued by a bear, he should have backed away slowly and calmly. <laughs> and that refers to standard uh, bear preventative advice that you will get when you are uh, hiking or backpacking or camping in bear country. Uh, which, which in America, you will get the same homily given to you by trail guides and, and uh, national park tenants, almost to the word. In North America, you have two bears that, that you will encounter. Uh, in most of North America, it will be black bears. And in uh, Alaska and extreme north and west United States, and of course in western Canada, you will encounter grizzly bears as well. You can, in those areas, you can encounter both. In most of America, you will encounter black bears. And the trail guides don't want anything to go wrong, of course, so they, they give you uh, standard advice. And the first piece of standard advice is that you don't want to encounter a bear at all. It's a little counterintuitive, considering how well bears can smell, but it is rather easy to surprise a bear. They get consumed in what they're doing. In eating or grubbing or whatever it is they're doing. And they can be surprised, especially if there's ambient noise. If you are if you are hiking near a loud river, you could easily round a corner and surprise a bear who didn't hear you because of the river. That's why hikers are all, the first thing they're told is make noise, which is counterintuitive to your granola chomping experience of being one with the wilderness. You don't like to think, you think you're being a bad human if you walk through an absolutely beautiful wooded dell making a lot of noise. But the you are still supposed to do that. That is still a very strong piece of advice. Make noise. Let Most bears don't want anything to do with humans. The minute they know that a human is around, they will start moving in the opposite direction. That's true for all animals. I ought to give humans something to think about, but nevertheless, helps a lot as a deterrent. Uh, most bears don't want anything to do with humans. So if they hear you coming, they will head in the other direction. So make noise. When you're hiking, make noise. Talk loudly. Talk continuously. Sing. Uh, bear cans with, with uh, pebbles inside them are often advised. Uh, some of that advice can be a little contradictory. If the singing is too high-pitched, for instance, or really bad, you could attract a bear who thinks you're a wounded animal. <laughs> I know most of my friends, when they sing, sound exactly like wounded animals. <laughs> but that is the main piece of bear advice is preventative. You don't give them a chance to know you're there and they will, you will probably never see them. And, but the, what this is referring to is if you do encounter a bear. If, if, if your attempts at prevention are unsuccessful and uh, you meet a bear in the woods. The, uh, the number one thing to do is, there are, well, there are a few with black bears or grizzly bears. First of all, uh, this, this description of European brown bear, uh, 
is a little misleading. You First of all, you want to know what kind of bear you're dealing with. You want to be able to identify at a distance what kind of bear you're dealing with because your behavior will be dictated by that. Brown bears are about human size, only hunched on four legs. And uh, black bears are about human size. And they're black, but they can be brown or cinnamon. So you want to look for other things. They have, for instance, a smooth sloping face and uh, sort of fine silky fur. Whereas grizzly bears... Are, have a dented face. They have a, a noticeable brow, and they also have a huge hump. Their shoulder blades make a hump on their back that, brown, that black bears don't have. And then, of course, there's the, the most convenient way to differentiate between the two species of bears, which is that grizzly bears are enormous. They're three times as big as black bears. So you will feel them. You will feel them walking on the ground. It will make a tremor in the ground. Uh, and they also react differently, which is where this advice comes in. Because when you, if you meet a bear, you want to let it know that you're a human. Talk to it in a low, soothing, confident voice. Do not make eye contact. Do not turn your back. And do not run. So counterintuitive advice. If you're walking down a trail, you round a, a high cop's corner, and you encounter a bear 10 feet away on the same trail heading towards you, all of your instincts are going to be to scream, turn, and run. All three of those are wrong. You must not do that. You must not do that. If you do that, you're guaranteeing an attack. You cannot outrun a bear. You cannot do it. You couldn't outrun a bear if you were on a horse. You certainly can't outrun a bear on foot. And, and if you turn and scream and run, the bear isn't going to have any choice in the matter. You're going to activate instincts in them that are millions of years old. And they are going to chase you, and they are going to pull you down and eat you. <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. And that will happen when it need not. If you encounter a bear on a trail, quietly, calmly talk to it while backing away, slowly, looking in the bear's direction, but not directly in the bear's eyes. Don't make eye contact. Don't do that. Look at the mass of the bear. Look at the hump. Look at the, the paws. Look at the, the general shape. Just blur it out in your mind so that you're not making direct eye contact. And then back away slowly and calmly, not quietly. Keep talking smoothly the whole time. Hey, bear, I don't want any trouble. This is your trail. Absolutely. Let it know that you're not a normal prey animal. And if you can, back away diagonally, not just directly back away from the bear. That can actually seem threatening. It would be threatening if you saw a human do that. If you can, a lot of times you can't because the diagonally would take you off the trail and you'd fall. But if you can, back away diagonally so that the bear can know without any trouble at all that you are deferring uh and that is that is what this advice is talking about of course it doesn't always come to that sometimes the bear wants to make contact with you sometimes the bear wants to push things if you have what park rangers euphemistically refer to as a curious bear then you have two different things to do depending on which kind of bear you're dealing with so you really have to know that familiarize yourself with what they look like if you're in any kind of territory where you'll get both. Most of America, you won't have to worry about it. The Appalachian Trail, for instance. You don't have to worry about black bears. And with black bears, they uh, don't have, usually, they don't have the courage of their convictions. Even a fairly big black bear will run if you challenge it. And that's what you want to do. You want to back away slowly. If that doesn't work, if the bear is still paying you attention, then raise your arms. If you've got hiking poles, wave them in the air and make yourself nice and big and yell at it. Get it, challenge it to get away from you. Almost always, a black bear will do that. It will turn on its haunches and run. It doesn't want any trouble. It, usually, that is the case. Usually, that is the case. If you encounter a black bear, a big male, a defensive mother, an adolescent with something to prove, if you're very unlucky enough to encounter a black bear that doesn't react to that at all, but still is paying you attention, ears up, attention forward, no clicking of the jaws, no snuffing, no pawing at the ground, no false charges, then that bear is praying. That bear is is going to try to take you down and eat you. And if that's the case, then you want to fight. Anything that you can. Pick up a rock, pick up a log. Uh, even at that stage, when a black bear has decided, in his tiny little mind, <laughs> that, that, okay, I'm not quite sure what this is, but I think I can probably eat its, its thigh muscles. Even when a black bear has decided that, if you start to make a fight of it, it will probably say, this isn't worth it. This just isn't worth it to do. 
And that is a different piece of advice from a grizzly bear. <laughs> if a grizzly bear continues to come towards you, ears up, attention entirely focused on you, no amount of frantic... A, a bear will do all sorts of frantic things, clicking its jaws, cracking its jaws, huffing, pawing at the ground, bouncing all around. If you have surprised it, if you've unnerved it, then, it, then a bear will do that. If a bear doesn't do that, if his, if his ears are erect and it's paying attention to you and it's walking steadily towards you, then it has made other decisions about you than just, oh my god, what are you doing here? And with a grizzly bear, again, don't look at the bear in the eye. You don't want to make things any worse than they already are. If you round a corner on a trail and you encounter a full-grown male, a full-grown grizzly bear, things are already just about as bad as they can get, so you don't want to make things any worse. So let's say you don't have bear spray, and let's say you don't have a gun. And it would be a bad idea to rely on either one of those things because a bear can shake off bear spray fairly quickly and they can shrug off a gunshot and you're only going to get one shot. So it, let's say you don't have either one of those. With a grizzly bear, your, uh, your attitude should, you must not fight. Still don't turn, still don't run, still don't scream. Instead, what you want to do is play dead. Lay down flat on the ground. Leave your backpack on your back. It's protecting your back. Put your hands, link your fingers together behind the, your neck and spread your legs in a V so that you're harder to tip over, so that you're harder to roll over. The bear is going to want to disembowel you. And the bear, a, a big, experienced grizzly bear that has been hunting for a couple of years is also going to want to break your spine so that you can't do anything. So you just lay there and it can have hot food. Um, <laughs> you, you, want, you want to do that. Present, don't be alarmed. Don't make any vocalizations. Just lay there dead. And if the worst comes to worst and a grizzly bear sees you do that and wants to explore a little. So, most times that won't happen. Most times when you do that, the grizzly bear will say, oh, okay, you're not any threat to me at all. So I was a little interested, but now I'm not anymore. I'm going to move on my way. If the bear is still interested in you, he might do some things that you will find very alarming. <laughs> very alarming. He might bite your thigh with teeth this big. So you will, you will feel it. You must try not to do anything. Don't react. Don't pull away. Don't scream. You must try. Your life is on the line to try not to do that. You might even have the horrible feeling, reported by so many people who have gone through it, of feeling the bear's teeth grinding on your skull bone. And you, again, you must just be calm. Any injury is better than dying. The bear might move you, might, might grab your backpack and just, it can lift you like a doll. It might grab your backpack and just move you around a bit. But even then, usually, even in that horrible worst case scenario, the grizzly bear will then move off. You might be hurt, but you'll still be alive and you'll be able to get the help. The key is, if you ever reach, if you're ever in that position, is don't get up too soon. You, that's also going to be an instinct of yours, is that once you, the bear sort of walks away, you're going to want to get up and get away. And of course, getting up and getting away is a very good idea, but don't do it while the bear is there. Wait until the bear has left. Not too long, because you'll probably be bleeding. You don't want to, you know, go into shock or anything like that. But wait until the bear has left. You'll know. I hope. <laughs> anyway, oh my god, that was such a long digression on bear safety, oh my. But anyway, this was a really good piece, but not all the, not all the Shakespeare pieces were. Some of them, uh, I don't mind if they're about books, uh, Shakespeare books that I haven't read. I don't mind that at all. Uh, the TLS's pieces are so good that you don't mind. They're so well written that you don't mind. Uh, but then we move on to, once we get out of Shakespeare, we move on to history. Oh, what's the matter, Bean? Do you want to see your, there's your little bear. <laughs> there's some bear safety. <laughs> you don't ever fake charge. Oh, when the bean charges you, she means it. <laughs> she means it. She's going after your toe. She likes to attack feet when they move in her domain. <laughs> I wonder what you would do if you encountered a bear. What would you do? Hmm? My beagles knew just what to do. They encountered many bears. <laughs> but you're... You're a civil dog. She, my 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 girls and Frida will never encounter wildlife as big as a bear. We will never go anywhere. <laughs> I wonder what she'd do. She'd probably read the Bear of the Riot Act and be the last thing she did on Earth. Uh, but anyway, we move on to history. We have uh, and, and one of the pieces of history here is Catherine Lewis reviewing a book that we've seen on this channel, Nicola Tallis's biography, Uncrowned Queen, her biography of uh, Margaret Beaufort, the... the uh, the mother of the Tudor dynasty, if we could put it generously. And uh, Catherine Lewis really likes her book. 
that's wonderful. That's fantastic. And uh, the the next history review is a full page review of uh, David Hall's book, The Puritans. The review is by Arnold Hunt, and it is another example in this TLS of a fantastic review. I had a review on Open Letters Review by Peg at the History Shelf. Peg Kirkowski did a review of Puritans. And this is also, hers was wonderful, and this is also wonderful, a wonderful review that of a type that I will, of course, pull this out and put it in my copy of David Hall's book. But it is, I, I don't mean to sound like, like uh, I, I, it's a kind of rarity for reviews to be this good, where it gives the book its due, gives you a full flavor of the book, disagrees with it a little, and ultimately renders a verdict. Just wonderful. Just a wonderful piece. I think that might be uh, the last such wonderful piece in this. I oh, no, no. The TLS has a piece in the middle of every issue called Freelance. Writers just get to write some little bit one way or another. I would imagine that for the rest of 2020, all the freelances will one way or another be about the pandemic. And in this case, it's true. A lot of them will probably be excruciatingly navel-gazing. But this case was wonderful. It's by Ian Sampson. Uh, who did a book we saw on this channel, September 1st, 1939, uh, the biography of a poem, one particular poem. He writes a piece here where he goes back home to live in the garage apartment of his elderly and ailing parents once he realizes that they are in extreme danger, that they are in vulnerable segments of the population. And it's totally unsentimental and wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I'd read a whole book. I'd read a whole book of this story. I hope... Uh, that one way or another, of course, I hope for the best. I hope that the book has a happy ending. But I hope he writes such a book. Because uh, if, if, if all the rest of it is as good as this little excerpt, I'd love to read it. Uh, there's also a review here by Victoria Rimmel of I, Poet by Kathleen McCarthy, a book we saw on this channel about Roman poets. Uh, her review was not... It was really good, but it wasn't quite as good as these two standout ones. The two standout ones that I just can't recommend strongly enough. Uh, and that, that was largely it. That is, that is largely the TLS this time around. The, uh, the back feature from the archive uh, is about, it's a review of a book about books. The only thing that was of interest to me was these vintage UK Asimov Foundation Trilogy paperbacks. Look at that. <laughs> I wonder what those cost online. Uh, but anyway, that was it. That was the, uh, that was the, the, uh, the TLS and the Vineyard Gazette, and that leaves us with only one other piece of mail. And the piece of mail that's left is not a, is not a periodical, and it's not a book. Instead, it's utterly remarkable, and it comes from one of you. I mentioned on this channel the other day, I was talking, I was doing a comic book tour, and I, I was talking about Superboy, the character Superboy, uh, who I grew up loving. He's my, actually my favorite DC hero. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a Superboy does, but not my Superboy. DC actually had three. Superboys, I'll let me show them to you. For a long time, Superboy was this. Clark Kent, as a teenager, living with Ma and Pa Kent in small town Smallville in the American Midwest with his dog, Crypto the Superdog, having adventures in small town as a teenager in the Superboy costume. And in the Superboy mythology, he then grows up, his parents die, and he grows up, and he becomes Superman and moves to Metropolis. But the whole world and the whole galaxy knew about Superboy before they knew about Superman. And Superboy was an incredibly popular character. He floated his own comics and his own appearances in adventure comics forever. And I loved him. Absolutely loved these issues. And uh, that was the first DC Comics Superboy. Then that Superboy went away. DC Comics was in a, a protracted court battle about the, the character and the, the trademark and whatnot. And in addition to that, DC Comics did a company ride reboot of their continuity that said that Superman, that Clark Kent only adopted the Superman persona when he got to Metropolis, and before that he had not worn the costume, which had a whole bunch of old-time comic book fans saying, well, what about Superboy? What about those hundreds of issues that I have in a box up in the attic? What about the Legion of Superheroes, which were inspired? Superboy was a member of the Legion of Superheroes. What about that? You're saying retroactively none of that actually happened. And, uh... DC Comics shrugged that off, and they moved on, and then they had a, a massively popular storyline where Superman dies, and briefly, while he's apparently dead, four substitute Superman crop up to take his place, and one of them is a boy who doesn't like people to call him Superboy, but they naturally do anyway, and it, he turns out to be a clone of Superman, and he is, that is this Superboy, this character. Uh, who has non-Kryptonian superpowers and who is a fan favorite. Readers liked him, liked him a lot. I think arguably of those, of the four Erzat Superman, he was probably the most popular. Had his own book for a long time, is still 
a character in DC Comics. But uh, slowly, over time, the original... It's a long story. We can get into DC continuity revamps some other video. But uh, DC had another continuity reboot where they, they redid all of their characters. And the classic versions of the characters were just sort of left on the wayside. And then fans reacted, and they hated it. And so DC gradually started changing things back, and they brought back the original Superman that they had revamped out of existence, who in the meantime <laughs> had married, had, had had a child with Lois Lane. A son. And that son grew up, first a boy, in a wonderful run, where, the, where the Superman and Action Comics briefly was a family. Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and their little boy who had superpowers. Jonathan was their son. And then uh, uh, a writer, again, I won't get into it, decided he wanted that boy to be a teenager and came up with a ridiculous plot device to get him to be a teenager. And then DC decided to relaunch the Legion of Superheroes, and what would the Legion of Superheroes be without a superboy that they transplant from a thousand years in their own past? So they chose Jonathan Kent, who is this character, in the Legion of Superheroes, which was going strong until the world shut down. Legion of Superheroes, I think this is number two. I think it got to number five, and then it just stopped. Uh, and this Superboy is yet a third Superboy. He is not uh, the, the clone, and he is not a teenage Clark Kent in Smallville. Instead, he is Clark Kent's teenage son. Uh, and I mentioned in this comic book video that a long, long time ago, there was a Superboy model that showed it showed Superboy with his cape furled out behind. It was a plastic model you could put together yourself. You got all the pieces. He was kneeling and he was he was saying hi to Crypto the Superdog, who was his best friend and who also had a red cape. And I got that model, uh, and I laboriously put it together. It was very hard for me to do. I don't have that kind of patience. I don't have that kind of sense of touch. And I succeeded. I, I wished that at the time, I, w I was going to say I wish I had pictures of it, but at the time, taking a picture of something was a huge deal. It's that, that kind of idea is totally alien today, where we all have cameras on us at all times and take pictures of anything. Then it would have been a big deal. And it would have been unthinkable for me to go to my parents and say, I want you to take a picture of this thing. Pictures were for Christmas. Uh... But I had that model, and I made it, and it existed for a glorious little bit of time until my beagles completely destroyed it. <laughs> uh, I was particularly fond of, of the original Superdog because it was pretty clear that despite the fact that he was all white, he was a beagle. <laughs> I was particularly fond of him for that. Uh, I loved that model, absolutely loved it, I, and I mentioned in a comic book video that I wished I had it still. I have not had the the courage to go on eBay or Amazon and see what that model sells for in 2020. I don't even want to know. It's probably intensely collectible. I don't know. But one way or another, one of you heard that and went on Amazon to order something for me. And it came in the mail. Will you look at this? Superboy and Crypto the Superdog. Can you believe that? Can you believe how generous you people are? It just stuns me. Absolutely stuns me. So we're going to open this. I don't care how long this video is. Uh, well, I do care. I will, I, will, I will stop after this. We're going to open this. And see, my own Superdog is extremely curious. <laughs> Superboy did not have a schnauzer. Or it's unlikely that he would have maintained uh, his positive disposition. We're going to open this thing and see what these things look like. Now, these are just action figures. This is not a model set like the one that I had. And as you can tell just by looking at this, it's not my Superboy. And it's not my it's not, not my crypto. That is Jonathan Kent. That is the third Superboy that we saw. Uh, but even so, these are going on that shelf. Absolutely they are. Let's see. Now, Frida, I don't want a reprise of the past, okay? I don't want you destroying this thing. <laughs> when, like my, like, look at this. She actually wants to re, it, this, is, this is traumatic for me. I have a Superboy statue again, and once again, it's being threatened by a dog. <laughs> I want you to behave yourself, little girl. These are not toys. These are not going to you. I'm going to keep this Superboy. Oh my, these are beautiful. Baby, you're not getting these. You're absolutely not getting these. No, you're not getting these. I'm going to put these out of your reach. <laughs> Do you believe that? Now, of course, this is neat. He's got the ripped jeans and this, the homemade costume. That is, that is not the teenage Jonathan Kent. The, the sacrilegious teenage Jonathan Kent that uh, one writer created that no fans liked. This is the little boy, Jonathan Kent, who's just figuring out his powers. 
But this, this is crypto. <laughs> that is effectively the same classic crypto. Cape and everything. That is that is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And my own my own crypto wants to know what this is. You you are not getting this. Absolutely not. This this Superboy in crypto I am going to keep. And I can't thank you enough. You know who you are, the one who sent this. I can't thank you enough for doing this. What an incredibly nice thing to do. <laughs> uh and then there's this thing. I guess that is the uh, the stand that they're supposed to go on. What have we got here, baby? I guess this is the you're supposed to put them on a stand. The stand has a uh, the the Superman symbol. I think that's what this is. Are they? Is it magnetic? Okay, it has a felt bottom, but I don't think it's magnetic. Oh, it is magnetic. Look at that. It is magnetic. Superboy is magnetic anyway. It doesn't look like crypto is. Crypto can go anywhere. <laughs> but Superboy is magnetic. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, man, you people are so nice to me. <laughs> so, all right, so so that was the other thing that came in the mail was a geek fest. <laughs> Just a pure geek fest. That, Frida, you are not getting this. I am not going to lose another Superboy in crypto to a dog. I'm not going to do it. No way. No way. So, so <laughs> All right, I clearly have uh, insurrection to deal with here, so I'm going to wrap this up. But I'll be back, and thank you so much. You know who you are. Thank you so much for doing this. What a nice thing. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.